and welcome to lecture number 10. In this lecture, we're continuing our discussion on system identification. This is part two in the system identification series. So here we are talking about system identification in this unit. We've talked about the four steps or the four parts of the system identification process. The experiment planning, the selection of the model structure, the parameter estimation, and the model validation. So we've gone through all of those for the basic case. In the ideal case, the least squares technique works great. The technique, however, begins to break down under some non-idealities, such as nonlinearity, quantization, noise. Unfortunately, these are very practical issues that arise in this process. And so the question is, how can we recover a good fit to a, a, a model, even in the presence of some of these things? <clears throat> so here are some approaches that we're going to talk about in dealing with some of these things. We're going to talk about, first of all, about filtered least squares. How do we do filtered least squares? What is, what is it? How do we do it? And next, I'm going to talk about averaging, which is another way of dealing with some of these things. And uh, then we're going to talk... So <clears throat> this is under noise and quantization. This is not nonlinearity. Okay, this is a st still assuming your system is acting in a linear way. It just has noise associated with it. So here's our setup. It's basically the same setup we had before, except now we have filters. We filter the input that goes into the, the system, we and we filter the output, and we filter with the same filter. So this is important. That we, that we filter with the same filter. Now, it's important that we use the same filter for both the input signal and the output signal. Why is that? Well, again, what we're looking for is an estimate of y over u of the, the transfer function p sub, sub h. That's what we're looking for. So the hat here stands for an estimate. So if instead we use filtered data, where the filtered data, uh, the tilde here represents the signals u and y that have been filtered, I can get an estimate of the system from that. And notice that we, here we have f times y, f times u. The f's cancel to give y over u. So this gives an, another estimate, a different way of getting an estimate for, for the system. And um, so the, the advantage is that we can filter the signals. And it's usually the Y signal that's the one that needs the filtering. So we can filter the signals, and in doing so, we can eliminate some noise. So in other words, you can clean up our signals before we do the system identification. And that's the advantage of this. We can actually clean up the signals, and this, it can be a big help. So the question now becomes, what do we choose for a filter? Well, if you already know something about the noise characteristics, then you can use what's called a match filter or a... Uh, a Wiener filter or other other kinds of uh, optimal filters. Otherwise, we can create a filter. We can create a filter for this process. And so how do we create that filter? Well, here's the process. So it's an iterative approach. That means we, we do it over and over. So the first thing, first step is to perform a least squares identification. So before filtering, we actually go through and do a least squares identification. And we use the results of that to form a filter. The filter is formed by the denominator obtained through the process, and then we use one as the numerator. So now we have a filter. We then filter the input and output. From that, we perform the least squares identification on the filtered data. So again, we filter both input and output. And then we use, we obtain a, a model for the system from this process. We use the obtained model, which is supposed, which, which hopefully is an improved model. And again, we choose the denominator, we choose one for the numerator, and we just do this over and over again until the system converges. That is, until our system identification process converges on a, on a transfer function. And then we stop there. So this is, this is an iterative approach. Basically, it successively updates the filter, improves the filter, so, and then eventually we get as good as possible as we can obtain through this method. So. This can give us a certain amount of, of, uh, of benefit. 
Okay, so here's an example. I'm using, this is my, system, my um, uh, excitation signal. Um, I scale it down by 0.18, put it through the digital to analog converter. I also have band limited white noise that's coming in. So, so this is the additive noise. So this is actually the actual output that's being measured. Okay, and I can also measure the original output just to compare. And so for the noise power, three times 10 to the minus seven. 10 to the minus seven is a small number. If we compare the, uh, the two signals, the one with noise and the ones without noise, the clean signal is the green, the noisy signal is the, uh, the crimson. And you can see that the difference between the two signals is very slight. So the noise is just a little tiny noise. So well, how does that affect the fit? Well, here are the results. The actual system has this frequency response. The fit that we get, just the standard fit, um, is this green curve. And as you can see, it does not do very well. Okay, So we get a very poor fit for our data. I mean, it misses the, the, uh, the notch. It misses the resonance. <clears throat> so not a very good fit at all, terrible fit, even with just a tiny bit of noise. This shows that the the uh, standard least square system identification approach is not very robust to noise. Okay, so this is the standard. This is the basic least squares fit. What happens when we do the filtering, like the me method I just showed or just talked about? Well, this is what happens. I can get this kind of a response. And you can see it's not perfect, but it does pretty pretty well. So notice that we ni, the number of times we actually filtered, was um, 16 times. So we we didn't just filter once or twice. We actually filtered 16, did this whole process 16 times, and we were able to recover a pretty good fit to our data. So not perfect, but, but pretty good. So that is, that's, again, but that was just a little tiny bit of noise. What happens if we increase the noise? So again, filtering is not the end all of system identification because for larger noise levels, even the filtering fails. So for example, three times 10 to the minus five. Um, again, after 267 iterations, the transfer function converges. And as you can see, it's not that great. The response is, it does find the resonance, but it misses the notch altogether. Low frequency uh, response is not good. And so, not a particularly impressive result here. So um, filtering least squares has limitations. Okay, so it was able to bias a little bit of noise, robustness, but um, not, so here three times 10 to the minus five is still pretty small. It's a hundred times, hundred times the noise from the previous example, but it's still fairly small. So. Okay, so now what do we do? Improving system identification under noise. Well, <clears throat> generally we want to use lots of data. So to work with this, we, we're going to do filtered least squares, but we're also going to do something called averaging. We're going to do averaging in the time domain and averaging in the frequency domain. Okay, and so it turns out this averaging is in fact a type of filtering. Okay, it, it's a different type of filtering. And so it, it actually provides some benefits that the filtering method itself does not do. Now, in doing averaging, we're going to make certain assumptions. First of all, we're going to assume that the noise is additive Gaussian white noise. Okay, so that's that's a pretty common model for noise. We're going to assume the noise generally has a zero average. Okay, so in other words, it has no DC component or zero DC component. And so basically what we're going to do is we're going to take several data sets and we're going to use the same excitation signal each time. We're going to keep it fixed. So if you apply the same excitation signal to the system, you should get exactly the same output. Now, because of the noise, we will not get the same output. And so what we're going to do is we're going to run the same experiment several times, collect the data, and then average the data sets. And in doing so, this tends to cancel out the noise. That's the approach. Now, there are often two different kinds of noises. There is what's called um, sensor noise. That's the noise that comes into your system. And then you have what's called process noise. 
Process noise is noise that enters into your system someplace other than where your control input enters. And so it actually affects the dynamics of the system. And that's a little bit trickier to figure out to deal with. But you can still work with it. It's just a, it's a different thing. So anyway, these are the two approaches we're going to, I mean, this is the, the method we're going to work with. We're going to take several data sets. So again, more data. And then we're going to average. Okay. So again, we assume that the noise is sensor noise. So now with the excitation fixed in each data set, the output is essentially the same, but with different noise. Taking the average of all the data sets will tend to reduce the impact of the noise of any single set. It turns out that the, if the number of data sets is greater than about 20, there's little improvement in the noise reduction. So what does this mean? This means we run the experiment, we run it more than 20 times, it's the same experiment, 20 times. Adding more data after that is not really going to help much. So going out to about 20, if, if you can't uh, get significant improvement by doing 20, you're, you know, it's, it's, it's not, not worth really going very much further. Averaging in the frequency domain. So that was averaging in the time domain. We, we apply the same signal a number of times, and then we average the outputs in the time domain. Then we do the system identification on the averaged output. And then we can do filtered least squares and all that kind of stuff. So that's in the time domain. Now averaging in the frequency domain. Now because of the noise, the computer transfer function ends up being close to the actual transfer function. Um, but not exactly. So what we do then is in the averaging approach, we actually compute several approximate transfer functions using different data sets. We average the numerators and average the denominators to obtain a frequency domain averaged transfer function. So, so in this case, instead of instead of averaging, averaging the output signals, notice averaging the input signals, if we're using the same input signal, the average is just the signal. So we don't need to average the, the uh, input signals, just the output signals. Now, in frequency domain here, we actually go through for each data set and we actually get a transfer function and then and then an, another experiment we get another transfer function and so forth so and then we get all these transfer functions and we average the transfer functions together that's the basic idea so an overall averaging approach actually involves both types of averaging time domain and frequency domain averaging so in this case the experiment the same experiment will be run that involves n1 by n2 data sets so you can see that the amount of data scales and <laughs> starts expanding very, very widely. So basically, we run the experiment n1 by n2 times. The data sets then will be grouped in n2 groups of data sets with n1 individual groups in the set, uh, sets in the group. The data sets in each group will be averaged, giving a set of n2 time averaged data sets. And then we get, uh, so each of the n2 averaged data sets will then be used to form the estimate transfer function. So we'll have n2 transfer functions that we will then average together. So graphically, it looks something like this. We have n1 sets, n2 groups. So n2 groups of n1 sets. Each of these sets, we time average. So we average them this way. Okay. And so then we get n2 average, time averaged sets. From each of these sets, then we obtain a transfer function. Okay, but using filtered least squares, and then we average the transfer functions together to get an overall averaged numerator, average denominator. So this is the approach that we, we, we look at. So what about that example that we had earlier where we, where we used um, noise that was 100 times the noise of the, of the basic problem? How does this work for that? Well, in this case, if we... So for this noise power, which is, again, that's 100 times what we had. If we use N1 being 20, so remember, beyond 20, it's no improvement. And then we have 5 for the frequency averaging. So altogether, we run the experiment 5 times, 20 times, 100 times. Wow. Well, you can see that it pays off. We actually get a really good fit to the data after doing that. So it definitely pays off. So we get a better fit for the system at the expense of a lot more data, 100 times the data. Okay. 
So that's pretty significant. Now, if you actually compare the signal with this noise level, we, we saw it earlier. We saw the two signals, one with noise, one without noise. You could barely tell the difference. Here, you can see that there's definitely a difference between the two signals. Okay, definitely a difference. So we, we are doing something significant here. But as you can see, it is at the expense of a lot more computations, a lot more experiments. So, Okay, so that's the noise issue. This is one way of dealing with the noise, averaging, filtering. Okay, those are the important things with noise. Now we talk about the situation of nonlinearity, and in particular, the saturation nonlinearity. So the saturation nonlinearity basically is a nonlinearity that involves clipping. So if you have, for example, a signal where you have a saturation in there, okay, and this is very common for this to happen. So saturation basically involves clipping the signal. Okay, it limits it to some some range. In this case, it looks like six and a half to six and a half. <clears throat> okay, so if the signal is larger than six and a half, it just stays at six and a half. If it's less than minus six and a half, it stays at minus six and a half. And so. Uh, in, in this case, I'm, I'm assuming an output saturation. And so it's easy to spot this in the time domain, not so easy in the frequency domain, to see that the clipping is happening. But when the clipping, clipping is happening, it's the system is no longer actually uh, be, uh, following the differential equation associated with the system, and so uh, it ends up becoming a lot more complicated problem. So <clears throat> here I have an input saturation to the system. That is, the saturation saturates the input here. And as, as you can see, if I scale the input, it affects the output. So this is the same input being applied to the system, um, but with different levels of k, different levels of gain. So when k is less than or, less than or equal to 3.7, we get a, a response that looks like this. That is, that's the response when there's no clipping. When we start getting clipping, you can see it affects the output, the magnitude of the output. So, and by gradually increasing the K, you can see that there's significant uh, effect on the output. So in general, it basically does something like reducing the gain of the system. That's kind of a rough, rough way of describing what's happening. It's actually much more complicated than that. Um, so here, notice we're taking, we're looking at the output and we're dividing it by the, the gain K. Okay, so th that's what we're getting. So why, why? Or are we dividing by k? So notice here we said k less than or equal to 3.7. So it, let's say k was 2. We're basically multiplying the signal by, uh, in this case, a constant signal. We're multiplying it by 2, and then we're dividing by 2. So a linear, for a linear system, you multiply by 2, you divide by 2, you get the same result, the original result. Okay. So dividing by k, since we're multiplying by k, basically cancels out the K. But when you have a nonlinear system, as you can see, it definitely uh, it's displayed that way. Okay, so how do we deal with the saturation? Well, one way is to use what's called a small signal approach. That is, we want to keep the signal levels as small as is workable. One way to do that is to work with our signal to have a small crest factor. So the crest factor, and keep it as close as one, close to one as possible. The crest factor um, basically looks at the control signal and divides by the RMS value of the control signal. Okay, And so this is, this is helpful for, for example, a random binary sequence, not so helpful for a sync signal. Okay, so, and basically we want to crank up the input so that the crest factor is as large as possible. So a random binary sequence is an example of something that has a large crest factor. So now we, uh, how do we deal with saturation? Here are some ways to deal with saturation. One is to get amplifiers that have an expanded range so that the input uh, uh, is, is not saturating. Another way is to get actuators that have an expanded range. So that is something that's actually in control, controlling it, having more headroom. Uh, another way is getting sensors with lower noise and higher range. Okay. And then finally, A to D and D to A converters with an expanded range. So these are some examples of actually adjusting, making adjustments to the system to, uh, to deal 
with saturation. Um, it's not always possible. Sometimes we're just stuck with it. So, but generally, if you know what it what it is, you can at least kind of work with it. So, how would we identify the saturation? Well, there are two methods. One is in the time domain. The other is in the frequency domain. The time domain is generally more effective, but you can definitely notice something in the frequency domain. So again, we apply the excitation, the excitation signal. It's small enough not to introduce clipping or truncation, and then we obtain the output. Next, we increase the excitation signal by some gain k. So the output now, we look at the output. A linear system would have the output equal to k times the original output. But if saturation is occurring, then the magnitude of y is going to be less than k times the magnitude of y naught. Okay, so um, by way of example, when k is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, we get this response. When k is equal to 6, we get this response. k is equal to 7. So we can see as we increase k up from 5, the, the magnitude goes down. Actually, this should be y divided by k is what that should be. So this is, this is a, a way of recognizing saturation. Okay. So notice I, I, I had basically the same response for all these values of k, but once I went to k equals 6, then I, I noticed it was reducing, and as I continued increasing k, the signal kept decreasing, and so uh, it was apparent that the actual saturation is somewhere between 5 and 6. Okay, so that's, that's how to identify the saturation in the, in the time domain. In the frequency domain, we, we can see the Bode diagram that we get when we obtain the frequency response, I mean the uh, system identification, this shows how the frequency response uh, looks compared to the, um, w with various levels of clipping. So the green is no clipping. Okay. Um, and so again, this is like perfect system identification. The red has 1% clipping, 2% clipping, 3%. Or actually 0.1%, so very small clipping, 0.2%, and so forth. And so even with a very small 0.4% is not a lot of clipping, yet it significantly degrades the transfer function. So that is, these are important uh, facets in dealing with system identification. And now we're going to get in and we're going to actually look at MATLAB and Simulink tools for doing system identification. Now we're going to look at the problem of working with a Simulink diagram to do system identification. So here we have the, a block diagram, Simulink diagram ready to go. So here's our unknown system and I've included a uh, and limited white noise with a sign, so this gives us basically a, a random binary sequence, these two together. I've set the sampling period to be the sampling period of the system that I, or, that I want to work with. Zero order hold also has the sampling period I want to work with. I collect the data as before. Uh, I put it into variable named UY data as an array. Okay, and I have written this program over here to work with this Simulink diagram. So I've chosen 2 to the 14 data points to work with, sampling time 0 0.05. This sim command executes this, the MATLAB simulation. I then extract the data from U and Y Right? And then I go through and I use this command lsident to do the system identification for various orders of system models. So this has model order 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the first number is the order of the denominator. The second is the order of the numerator, in the, and this is in the z domain. So generally this the second number will be one less the first number. And so I, def I define the numerator and denominator to have the order that I'm working with. 
and then I define the LTI objects to make those transfer functions. Notice that I add the T in order to make this each one a discrete time model. I then go through, take the FFT of both Y and U, and again, I'm only using half of the data because the, again, it's equally spaced around the unit circle, and so one half is just the, the mirror image of the other, so I just look at the, the positive frequencies in a sense. P hat is the uh, estimate of the transfer function. I then form my frequency vector. Um, it's important to re remember you go, you're, you're going to use half the number of data points, so n divided by 2, and so 0 to n divided by 2 minus 1. And the frequencies go out to pi over t. So if you use this, you need to divide by n over 2, otherwise uh, you'll, your frequencies will be really high. <laughs> It'll be surprising. So there's my frequency. I go ahead and redefine p hat as an FRD object that has the, the frequency estimate omega and t is the sampling time associated with it. Since I know a t, I can put that in there. Otherwise, you can just use the value of 1. Um, but if you know the value of t, you're going to be able to actually compare what you obtain with other transfer functions like other ones we've obtained over here. Uh, figure 1 basically opens up figure 1. I'm going to do Bode mag instead of just Bode. Okay, so this only looks at the magnitude plot of the Bode. And so I'm going to compare p hat along with system 1, 2, 3 of orders, system 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. I go ahead and scale my axes so that I can look at the valuable thing, uh, valuable data. Otherwise, you just get, you get some extreme plot that it's kind of like hard to see what the real action is. And then I, I, this actually does a legend that, that the legend is associated with each of the, the plots. This command, location best, puts the legend in a good location. Sometimes the default location isn't always the best. Then I go through for systems of order 3, 4, and 5, I go through and, and do a ZPK on each of those. So I'm going to go ahead and run this program. So it ran the simulation. It's doing the calculation. And now, so it's, it's identifying the system. And now here's the Bode plot. And so let's take a look at the Bode plot. So the p hat, that's the data. So you can see the data back behind, and you can see it, this blue stuff over here. It, it does a lot of stuff, and then it's kind of noisy over here. But So you see green is when the, the order of the system is, is 1, and you can see that it doesn't really fit the model well at all, the data. So notice I only have the data to compare, and so uh, the blue is is the data that that I would be comparing. Um, I don't have the actual transfer function to compare, so I kind of have to use the data as an, an estimate of what to actually look at. And again, generally what, what happens is when you have large magnitudes, the fit, the, the data tends to fit the actual response better than when you have small magnitudes. So notice that the magnitudes up here are like 0 dB, whereas the magnitudes down here are like 20 or th minus 30 dB. It, the fit is not as good with the data. So I can also see the second order model does not fit very well. So we can pretty much rule out the first order and the second order model. Now what about the third, fourth, and fifth order models? Well, here, n equals 3, n equals 4, n equals 5. Uh, you can't actually see them. You can see n equals 5 because that, that's the color. But you can't see n is equal to 3 and n is equal to 4. So it's like, what happened to them? Well, what, what actually is happening is that they're actually being uh, over, overwritten. So the plot for n equal 4 overwrites the plot for n equal 3. The plot for n equals 5 overwrites both of the others. So we can't actually see them. So they're actually overlapping. It's difficult to see them. Um, if we now go back and look at the ZPK for each of the three systems, third order, fourth order. So the reason I only did third order, fourth order, fifth order, instead of second order, first order, second order, is because the first order and second order clearly did not, uh, did not fit the system very well. So we won't be using that. So instead, we're just looking at the third order, fourth order, and fifth order. Okay, so let's look at these, pl look, look at these values. So notice that the gain out the front is the same in all cases. So we can pretty much take that as gospel. Uh, the second, uh, the zeros, notice it has the same 
zeros in each case, and so we're pretty much guaranteed that that's the correct value for the zeros. If I look at this transfer function versus this transfer function, notice that they're actually these three poles are these three poles. Those zeros are those zeros. And I have this extra pole and zero. And notice that the actual extra pole and zero actually cancels. It's the same values. Similarly, with the fifth order, I have these same poles. I have these same three poles. And then I have this pair of complex poles. But notice they cancel. So we can be pretty certain that this is actually the order of the system as it ought to be. Going up to a fourth order system has not actually given us any better fit. And in fact, it, it ends up with a pole zero cancellation. So, so in, in the spirit of the principle of parsimony, we would choose the third order model for our identified model. Okay, so that's, that's what we're going to use here. Here we have basically the same system. Notice I've got a different name here. And it's basically the same system. It, it uh, however, is not the same. Um, in this particular case, if we actually look under the map, we see that we have some white noise in the system. So we can actually look at the noise there and, and see that there's actually noise in the system. So it's basically the same system, but with noise added. So let's see how our system identification program that we just used, how does that work with this system? So notice I've changed example two here. Otherwise, that's the only change I need to make. So I'm going to go ahead and run the program. So it does the simulation. And actually, simulation does really quick. Uh, but calculation takes a little while. Now, now here's our plot. And as you can see, the first order still does not fit very well. But the second, third, and fourth, and fifth orders are all about the same. I mean, they're slightly different. But it's hard to tell that one is actually better than the other. And they definitely don't follow things down here at all. So at least according to what we're seeing here, the noise is sufficient to, to completely wipe out any, any sense that we have a good fit from any of these. Okay, there's, there's, no, there's no clear sense that, that any of these provide a good fit to the system. So, so what do we do? Are we stuck? Of course not. All right, now we're going to take this system that has the noise associated with it, and we're going to um, try to do some of the filtering least squares. So here is the program we would use, basically the same program we had before, except now I'm going to use lsidentf. lsidentf uh, just looks at the model order, and it makes it strictly proper, so uh, we don't actually have to put the n and the m, just the n. It automatically makes the m n minus 1. And so I can do the different orders. In this case, I'm only doing second to fifth order. Um, we already saw that the system definitely was not first order, so I'm going to go ahead and skip that. And we also saw that when we did the system identification and we had noise using just the lsident, that we ended up getting a system that had um, uh, that all where all the, the fits uh, from second to fifth order looked very similar to one another. Okay, so uh, the the noise, which was at a noise power level of ten to the minus four, which is really small, uh, was enough to swamp the system identification algorithm so that it didn't give us any kind of good result. So now now we're going to use this lsidentf, and this basically does an iterative, the iterative process of filtering and then using the, uh, uh, sorry, of doing a system identification, using the results to form a filter. That filter then uh, is used to filter the data, and, and that gives us the next uh, model for our system identification. And that model th then becomes the filter that's used to then filter the data again to get us a new model and so forth. And so it iterates until it converges, until the, uh, till the uh, the result no longer changes, and then and it will do that up to a certain number of times. And if it if it doesn't ever converge, then it just says it just quits and gives you the best thing that it can. All right. 
right? So that's that's what this function does. And so we do the same kind of thing as we did before in, in the previous code. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. So simulation takes a short time. The calculation takes quite a bit longer because now it's not just doing the system identification, but it's also doing this iterative filtering thing. So each time it's actually filtering and doing system identification. And here's the result that we get. So what are, what are we seeing here? Okay, so the data is the blue, and you can see it's a little thicker because of the noise. The data, um, n equals 2, is still bad. n equals 3, and n equals 4, and n equals 5, again, are overlapping. So we can see that for this particular, uh, this particular level of noise, our filtering was successful. Let's go look now at the ZPK for each of these. And as we and we can see again that that basically we're get can, getting cancellations occurring. So that's canceling. This is canceling with that. So notice they're not exactly the same. They're very close. Uh, but this basically shows us that the third order again is sufficient for this problem, and thus filtering was successful at being able to do uh, at being able to uh, identify the system. Now notice that when we were at n equals two. We actually ended, ended up getting this error message indicating that the number of iterations was exceeded. In other words, it, it tried and tried, and the best thing it could give was not a good fit. It knew it wasn't, but it only goes a certain number of times. Just It won't go on forever. So this will iterate until the, the transfer function converges, and as you can see in the third, fourth, and fifth order cases, it does just fine. All right? So... So that's the situation. Now, what happens if we increase the noise in here? What happens if the noise of our system is increased yet further? So I'm going to increase the noise level here um, by e to the minus 3. So this is 50 times the amount of noise. Okay, 50 times the amount of noise. And um, so I'm going to go ahead and run this program again. Again, it does the calculation. The simulation goes by really quickly. It's the calculation that takes a long time. So it's, it's thinking about it. Boom. OK, so now let's look at the results. So again, n equals 2 is still this guy here. n equals 3, n equals 4, n equals 5. Notice that it's, uh, they're still overlapping. You can see that the noise is definitely a lot bigger. Look how, look how much more fuzzy that line is than it was before. So there's definitely a lot more noise in the system, 50 times the amount of noise. So what do the, what do the poles look like, the ZPK? Well, this looks similar to what we had before. And again, we're here we're getting a similar kind of thing with cancellation. And we're getting these guys canceling here. So we're actually finding very similar um, results, even with 50 times the noise. This shows how effective the filtered least squares can be. It's very effective. So what happens if we increase it even more? Now, I'm not going to increase it by 50 times again. I'm just going to increase it by from 5, 5 times 10 to the minus 3 to 6 times 10 to the minus 3. Let's see what happens here. So it, it, we've just changed it by an incremental amount as opposed to 50 times. So now, what are we getting? Well, the red is the third order. That is, we've lost the third order. The third order clearly no longer represents the model of the system. Um, and so, a small, in this case, a small change in the amount of noise resulted in losing the thir that third order model, which um, we saw before, really, the system was a third order model. So we, we really lost the capability. And so you can see that, in a sense, the noise breaks the system. Okay, It, it was working fine, and then just a little bit more noise broke the system. It, it didn't work anymore. So you, you have some of that kind of thing going on when you do the system identification approach. So this is filtered least squares. Next, we're going to do the averaging, time averaging, system identification. So in this case, we're going to start with the same band limited white noise, but in order to do the in order to do the 
averaging properly, this noise really needs to be completely random. Now, as you recall, when you have a random number generator, it requires a seed. And so, in this case, I'm going to take the seed that involves, it, it goes and grabs the clock, multiplies it out. I take the ceiling of that, which gives, the, gives an integer, positive integer. And so, this, when it grabs the time, that time will be somewhat random compared to, from one run to the next. In other words, it will not be the same seed. And because it has a different seed each time it runs, we will get a different um, we will get a different noise. Okay. If you keep the same seed, you will get the same noise. And if you try to do filtered least squares do, <laughs> with that, you won't get anything meaningful because it's always adding the same noise in every time. And so when you try to average it out, it doesn't average out because you, you have the same noise every time. So that's important. And so in my MATLAB routine, I go ahead, I run the simulation first, I extract the Y data, and then each time through the loop, I go ahead and extract the Y data again and add it all together. So this is like a, it's accumulating the values of Y. And then when I'm all done, I add, this is the averaging. So the sum and summation has been d done all along, and then we divide, and then we use that for our system identification. So if we run this program, you can see it's continuing to uh, simulate. And here I have it simulated for 20 times. And so it's going to run through this 20 times. And boom, we get a system identification. It's, and you can see it fits very well here. And it looks l very much like what it did before when the noise wasn't nearly so high. Okay, So this gives us a good confidence that the system identification is actually effective in this high noise environment. Our next experiment involves, again, leaving the, the noise alone um, and changing our program so that now I'm going to do frequency averaging. In frequency averaging, then, each time we do an experiment, we do system identification on that data. From that data, we get a numerator and denominator, and then we're going to average the numerator and denominator. So when we're all done, we average the numerator and denominator and get our system model. So here, we have a lot more calculations in the loop than we did before. All right, so let's take a run at this. So you notice when it does the simulation, it does the simulation, then it has to do a bit of calculation. And notice that in this case, when it does the calculation, um, sometimes the... Uh, the, uh, fil it does filtering least squares, and so sometimes the number of iterations is exceeded, and so that can be a problem when we're working with this, because if the number of iterations is exceeded, that means we know we don't have a good fit, and so we really shouldn't be using that transfer function anyway. So sometimes it goes through and actually gets a, a reasonable transfer function. Other times, not. So our lsidentf function has no way of discriminating whether the fit was good or not. So in this case, we're just taking the best it gives us. So it's possible that we could actually get something useful using something like, like this. Um, but what we're seeing now is that because the number of iterations being exceeded, uh, it's probably, yeah, it's not going to give us anything particularly good. Okay. So it did the best it could, but it's not as good. So basically what this says is that the frequency averaging is, not, is, only, is, is only good if the filtered least squares is actually able to produce something worthwhile. So if it, if it actually converges. So, so we, ha we have this result. So in general, the time um, averaging tends to be a little bit more effective than the frequency averaging, but the frequency averaging also does contribute some. But it, again, it depends on the filtered least squares actually producing something meaningful or useful, so that, that is an issue. Finally, in our last experiment, we're going to be doing at time and frequency averaging for our system identification. 
So in this case, we have n1, which is 20, and n2, which is 5. And so now we have a double loop. Okay. So in the inner loop, we basically are doing a simulation. Okay. N1, so we do that n1 times, and we average the y values. Okay. So when we're all done with that loop, we average them. We use that to create a system identification model using filtered least squares. We take those numerator and denominators, and we average those. Okay, and so when we're all done, we, we divide by n2 for numerator and denominator, and so we get we get this system, and, and so this, this does both time and frequency averaging. So the time averaging occurs in this inner loop. That information is used to do the, the frequency averaging, and, and so that's how this works. So we run this program, and you can see it does a lot of simulations that, well, should be doing plenty. And then it's going to stop for a moment, and it's going to, um, it's going to run the uh, LSIDENT app. So this simulation takes a while. So, and there's our result. So, there's our result that we get. So, we can see it, it, it does have that notch there. Oh, there we go. It does have the notch there associated with our system, like we're, we're expecting. So, this is the result that we get. And it, base, it gives us a fairly good response fairly close to what we were obtaining before. So this is time averaging, filtering, uh, and filtering least squares, and frequency averaging. So all of the above. And uh, so th these are some, some tips for doing system identification when you have a noisy signal. Thanks for watching.